I recently read an interview with you uh, that was done in preparation for the, the show you had at the Museum Brandhorst. And towards the end of the interview, you said something like, uh, even now, periodically, I think, can I somehow make my interest in drawing and line and composition into a painting show or a drawing show? And then I think, hmm, maybe not yet, but someday I'd love to make paintings. I just haven't figured it out yet. Luckily, the art world provides a space where you can figure out how and when. So that was a few years ago, and obviously, um, well, maybe not obviously, but we're, we're in a show that might be called a painting show. So what changed to make you feel you could do this kind of a show? Yeah, I think that was maybe 2016, that interview, which yeah. was, I had just started experimenting seriously with computer graphics, um, with 3D rendering programs. I think the year before, in 2015, but I, I didn't know where it would go. And I think it took me some years to figure out how to, what to do with it. And it, it came out as paintings. I couldn't have predicted that. Yeah. I started working with those programs and making uh, moving images, which is in fact, what the, the program I used was even invented for. Um, it's, it's definitely not made for making paintings. And before we come on to the 3D rendering programs themselves and, and how you've used them, um, I just want to ask some questions about the materiality of these works. Um, they're definitely not works on canvas, or stretched canvas. Um, some are um, on aluminum panels. Some are on wooden boards. Um, why those supports, uh, and why not canvas? Well, I can tell you I've got canvas in the studio, and it, it didn't work. I have nothing against canvas. I, I, you know, sometimes you try, and it just does, it doesn't catch. Um, I've been using metal in my work for this aluminum for, um, I don't know, since 2007 or something, and I always had it around, and I like it. And there's something about the way that the paint goes on it. It's so fast. And um, I like that these, this particular panel is, is highly reflective. Um, and then the wood, I guess, wood had also been something I'd used for years. Uh, so it was also it was a material that was known to me. It was in the studio. I like it. Um, it worked with this series of work because it's natural, it's, um, you can see it in a photograph and you immediately know what it is, what it feels like. These can kind of recede into, as an image, they can recede into a white plane, like any other white plane. I mean, if you look at it quickly, it could, it could be on canvas in a photograph. The wood never lets you think that. Um, I'm going to come back to the paintings, but I want to ask a sort of more general question. In another thing that you've raised in an interview before is the idea of the artist who is part of a kind of community of artists in their 20s and 30s and then who goes off and works pretty much on their own later on. Um, uh, and how being part of a dialogue with, with a group of people informs and pushes the work forward. Uh, and it made me think about like, like how, how these paintings connect to a set of inquiries that friends of yours, colleagues of yours, have been thinking about for a while. The relation of the more very basically the dig digital and the analog is something that's going on in the work of Laura Owens or Jacqueline Humphreys or um, Wade Guyton and, and others that you're, you know, artists that you're very, you know, you know very well. Um, and how do you connect? your own interest in painting to, to that community? Huge connection. I mean, I, 20 years ago, you know, when I started um, kind of thinking about how to make art that I could show someday, I had no, I really had no interest in painting. Um, I didn't look at it. I didn't really care about it. But the, the artists that, that I 
met and became friends with were almost all painters, um, which just occurred to me the other day. I mean, you know, if I also maybe a photographer here or something, but I didn't. Um, it, it was interesting to, to go for some years having a kind of artistic conversation with people who were doing, I mean, they're not only painters and maybe, and some of them, you know, make work that some people might say is not even painting, but, um, you know, they're making, they're making imagery that's on a flat substrate that's rectangular, that's hung on the wall, that is, you can see in a tradition of painting that goes back hundreds of years. Um, and I think I just, yeah, I started, at a certain point, you just start learning from people. And if you're in dialogue with them, of course, their concerns become yours and vice versa. And the question of how to integrate digital tools into analog art making is this huge curveball that everybody's been trying to figure out for the last 25 years or something. I mean, you're of the generation like me who grew up before the internet uh, and before social media. And so, you know, um, for you, you, there was a moment where, well, actually, maybe you only started making art at the point where there was a search engine. Um, but, you know, um, some of the colleagues that you were mentioning or that I was mentioning before, they went to art school at, at a point, or they started making painting at a point prior to digital procedures, the internet, and so on. Um, and the way in which they think about those things, I think, is very generational in as much as those technologies came into um, everyday life a few years into their own practice as artists. Um, I think it's different from people in their 20s who never knew any difference. How do you think your generation, you, you know, your um, born in 1973. So how do you think that your age, I guess, or generation impacts on, on your sense of this, what it means to put a CGI figure um, and an analog uh, hand print in the same space? Well, it might have been a little different for me only because I, I didn't study, you know, traditional plastic arts yeah. and, um, but I, I was making, you know, I went to college. I didn't go to art school, but I went to college and I was started making uh, film and video when I was there. And film and video are like almost closer to the source of, of computer imagery than traditional plastic arts. So when you, in the 90s, when this 3D or just digital technology start bubbling up, it kind of hits film and video first because all of a sudden you're editing with, um, God, I can't, Avid or whatever people are using back in the 90s. And I remember starting to do a lot of work with film and video and, and music. I was doing a lot of sound and audio. And that was all going through the computer. And the artists that I knew at the time were doing screen printing and things like that that were very analog. And in fact, at that time, it's kind of hard to even imagine now, but you know, making art with a computer was kind of weird. It was there's like you know an asterisk next to it. It was like new media art, or it was seen as nerdy, or kind of just beside the point. Um, even even in film and video, the first you know when I was making videos using a search engine and um, digital effects in 2000, that was I would show them at film and video festivals and they were unusual at the time, I think. People were not um, so into them. Um, and this is just to say, I kind of came in through this other portal. What's the relationship between the um, conventions of display uh, that you've used to create these walls and the space of the gallery that you've created and the space in the images um, that you've painted? I think it was, I think it was a response to the room. I think I wanted to break up the space, but I didn't want to build walls that were massive. And by tying them into the ceiling and floor, you can actually make them very thin. 
Yeah. Um, and the paintings are quite thin. It was just some feeling about space. Yeah. In the painting Lata OSB, yeah. um, it looks like you've scrawled into one of the pores with your fingers uh, to um, write a word that's not a word that's in the English language, as far as I know. Um, can you say something about that moment in that painting? I like what the language does in a lot of these pieces, um, but I didn't want it to be... I didn't want it to interfere by, by meaning something. You know, it's the same with the 3D. You know, it's like you want it to be an object that is taken very seriously by a viewer. It's, it's like a real part of the composition. You know, I don't actually think meaning is, the, the, you know, the enemy of art, but it's like something like that. Yeah. Like, I mean, it does something when you write or, or print text on an image. It does something to the other forms of mark making. Yeah. And I think that's what I like is that kind of the way that it affects a gestural mark or or a, or a computer print for that matter. It's like kind of triangulating and it's I mean I think I've you know it's something I did with the the vacuum forms and with the calendar paintings. It's like the idea that you could have one kind of imagery in the picture plane and then you have something else that uh, has its own world of aesthetics or meaning, and they're right next to each other, and you have to kind of um, put that together, but they don't fit. Thought Comes from the Body um, is a title that um, reminds me of um, some of the, well, the philosophical discussions, but discussions also among artists um, from another moment. Uh, competing artists, some of whom wanted to almost imagine conceptual art as being not grounded in bodies and bodily experience, and other artists in the, at the same moment who are insistent that we don't think outside of our bodies. Why did you use that title? It was something I had used in some writing I'm doing right now, and it's I think it's a, it's a kind of compelling thought that thought comes from the body because when you, when you think about it, it sounds like an interesting proposition or something, but then, of course, it comes from the body because the mind and the brain is part of the body, so then it's also simply a kind of trivial thing to say. Um, but I like this idea that thought comes from the body, because, you know, on the one hand, you can say the body is, like, the vital thing that, like, yes, of course, we know thought comes from the body. Everything good comes from the body because the body is energy and vitality, passion and impulsive movement. But you can also say the body is the thing that dies and rots and, like, you know, the flesh as opposed to, you know, infinite mathematics or something. Um, I, mean, I see it as quite an, an interesting and important title in relationship to this group of works because um, what happens in this group of works is that these um, CGI images are made to inhabit a very physical space. Um, the idea, the opposite, the idea that thought doesn't come from the body, would almost, could, I imagine that would be a claim that would be appropriate for um, works of art where a CGI image is sort of floating in a non-physical space. Yes. Um, but what you do is you ground the CGI image in a very physical space and play with its, you know, this amazing idea of having a gesture reflected in a CGI image. So in some way, I feel that that idea, and the body is, present very much in these works, in the handprints, the smears, and so on, but also you as a, me as a viewer in front of them, um, you're kind of conscious of your body because of looking into these, um, both th these uh, holes or rings, but also you're conscious of your body because you're seeing bodily marks. So 
I mean, what I guess I'm saying is that thought comes from the body seems a good, a, appropriate title for not just one painting, but for almost mm -hmm. the show. Yeah, you were talking earlier about you know my generation dealing with digital and analog and trying to understand how those go together. But you could also say, it's maybe just a slight rephrasing or rethinking of the same thing, but you could talk about material versus immaterial. That's the thing that not just artists, but everybody is having to deal with now, having a material existence, but also you have an immaterial existence in the thing in your pocket. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's a way that you know you you are the hand, and you're also the hand held, and this is this is like a this is the major kind of thing to deal with, whether it's it's art making or it's it's commerce or you know romance or something. So I think that's probably something I've thought about a lot. I mean, in some of the earlier work that had to do with circulating images and how they crop up in physical form or not, or like kind of recede back into data. And then in these pieces, painting is very bodily. And, um, and actually, I think that's a better way to talk about it than analog. Analog and digital is such a, I almost never want to hear that kind of pair of terms again. Um, at this point, it's, it's the things that are material, that, that we live as material life, and there's this other world that, that we live in that's equally real, and how to understand those two things together.